Food Heals Podcast, Episode 70. Just with this diet in 60% of the cases, they were curing type 2 diabetes with a diet that was 93% sugar. They, what? Uh, this is blowing my mind right now. I know. This is new information. Oh, my gosh. Holistic Voice presents the Food Heals Podcast with your hosts, Alison Melody and Susie Hardy. Join the Food Hills Nation and learn the secrets to go from feeling unwell to healing yourself. Warning, side effects of this podcast may include increased health and vitality, thoughts of living longer, an increase in sexual activity, feelings of joy, cravings for kale and quinoa, and a spike in Tinder matches. In rare cases, women have experienced a strong desire to change their status update from hashtag blessed to hashtag OMG even more blessed than yesterday, hashtag loving life. If you've experienced any of these symptoms, make sure to tweet a Kardashian immediately. All right. Welcome, Food Heals Nation. Thanks for joining us. I'm Allison Melody. And I'm Susie Hardy. Today's guest is Dr. John McDougall. Dr. McDougall is a physician and nutrition expert who teaches better health through vegetarian cuisine. He has been studying, writing, and speaking out about the effects of nutrition on disease for over 30 years. Dr. McDougall is the founder and director of the nationally renowned McDougall Program, a 10-day residential program that he and his wife, Mary, host at a luxury resort in Santa Rosa, California, where medical miracles occur through diet and lifestyle changes. The McDougall Program not only promotes a broad range of dramatic and lasting health benefits, but, most importantly, can also reverse serious illnesses including high blood pressure, heart disease, diabetes, and others, all without the use of drugs. It's an amazing program. But before we get to our interview with Dr. McDougall, we have to tell you about today's sponsor, Acuity Scheduling. Schedule clients without sacrificing your soul. Are you looking for the perfect scheduling tool for your business? Are you sick and tired of sending emails back and forth and wasting your precious, precious time scheduling your clients? If so, we've got the solution for you. If you are a small business owner, maybe a massage business like me or a podcast like us, where you have to schedule appointments on a regular basis, Acuity is the only scheduling and time management tool you will ever need. It really is. We're not just saying that. (laughs) No, it really, really is. Trust us. Acuity allows you to automate your clients' bookings, cancellations, reminders, and even payment with one click and zero frustration. Clients, or guests in our case, can see your real-time calendar availability, self-select the time that works best for them, and easily book and pay for their own appointments in advance, sparing you those stress headaches, mix-ups, and grunts of frustration. And they have four convenient packages for you to choose from. That's right. The $10 level for emerging entrepreneurs, a $19 a month level for growing your business, and a $34 a month level for larger businesses. So go to acuityscheduling.com slash foodheals. Pick the package that suits your business needs. You will not regret it. (laughs) Get started today. Go to acuityscheduling.com slash foodheals to get a 45-day trial. 45 days free, Food Heals Nation. You can see which package works for you. Next up, our interview with Dr. John McDougall. The Food Heals Podcast starts now. Today, we're here with an incredible guest, Dr. John McDougall. Dr. McDougall created the McDougall Program, which is all about giving you control over your health. Most of his participants are able to stop all unnecessary medications, avoid surgery, improve their appearance, and regain lost fitness. And word is spreading. His website, www.drmcdougall.com, receives 7 to 8 million hits a month. The McDougal MD TV show is playing in 95% of households worldwide. Dr. McDougal's right foods are in nearly 4,000 stores. His free newsletter is going out to 30,000 people monthly, and he makes new friends every month at their sessions, 10-day medical live-in programs, 5-day programs, advanced study weekends, celebrity chef weekends, and adventure trips. In his free time, he spends it with his family. We are very excited to have Dr. McDougall with us. Welcome, Dr. McDougall. Welcome. Welcome. So can you tell, we went through your bio, but can you tell Food Heals Nation just a little bit about yourself, who you are and what you do? Well, number one, what you need to know is I'm a grandfather. Mm -hmm. I have seven grandchildren. And pretty much, yeah, it's cool, huh? They go all all the way from seven months to uh, 12 years. And it's really what my whole life is about anymore. You know, I've enjoyed being a doctor. 
but the things that I do now for food are for them. Mm-hmm. Because, uh, you know, I used to be very much involved in curing people's diabetes and keeping them out of heart surgery and, you know, uh, stopping their multiple sclerosis. And that was fun. And I, and I like that. I like to help people. But these days, uh, even though I still do that, I have trained many other doctors to do it, too. And it's really easy to do. But what I'm focused on these days, at least you know, in my personal thoughts, I sometimes get to share it with an audience, is the the way the planet's going and the, the terrible impact that uh, our eating habits are doing on our planet. Yeah. And uh, so, you know, that that's what, what's most for me. Uh, I used to be very insensitive to uh, animal rights and the abuse of animals. Uh, I, I didn't have my eyes opened on that subject uh, probably until maybe 15 or 20 years ago. Mm-hmm. So I was really kind of a a one one thinking kind of doctor, just I was a doctor out there healing people until I discovered this food thing was just so much more and had so much more importance than, uh, you know, keeping somebody from getting uh, cancer or uh, not that these things aren't very, very important. There are just issues that are so much more important when you can when you're talking about, uh, uh, you know, changing people's diets. Yeah. So, you know, you know, that's kind of where I'm at now. And I know people get a little irritated with me when I run my clinics and they came there for me to get them off all of their high blood pressure pills and their diabetic pills. And I give them a little, uh, I give them a, uh, a little uh, rush about how we got to save this planet by get, getting off the beef and getting on the rice. I mean, Susie and I just have to tell you that that's our dream come true. Like you're our dream doctor, you know, no, like the fact that you would say things like that, because I feel like that's what's lacking in so many places these days. And people aren't talking about diet. They're not talking about the environmental impact. And you must be the best, most wisest grandfather for uh, those children, you know. Well, you know, that's why I'm doing it, because great. I, I've had my life and I'm nearly 70 years old. Yeah. And uh you know, I care for my children, but most I care for my cho- grandchildren. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I go out there and I fight the fight every day. Uh, but if you ask me what's what's the most important, that that's what's important to me, most important to me. But I think you asked uh, how did all this get started? And yeah, where I've been. Uh, I had to, lived in Michigan, and uh, for for twenty five years, and I personally had very 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 bad health. I. Uh, as a child, I had terrible stomach pains and horrible mm. constipation. I'd be embarrassed to tell you about it. <laughs> I had uh, poor endurance. So I never did well in the on the athletic field. I got act, <clears throat> acting and oily skin as a kid. There are all, all kinds of minor problems that were, you know, were major to me then that I can relate back to what I ate. And then I went off to college to Michigan State University to be what? I don't know. I had no idea what I wanted to be. And three months into college, I uh, had a massive, a massive stroke, mm-hmm. and it left me completely paralyzed for two weeks. And uh, after I could move my thumb, I decided the doctors were doing nothing for me, and so I, 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 I left against medical advice. Wow! Wow! And, yeah, that's really so, bold. It's very brave. <laughs> At 18 years old, it was something. But I had enough of these people. Well, that's two really big things. Having a stroke at 18 is like unheard of. And then the fact that you were willing to, at that young age, go against their orders. I guess, well, teenagers always do go against orders. No, but when you have something, I would think that when you have something that major of that magnitude, I mean, a stroke is very serious at that age. And at that time, you know, to to have the, the, to actually listen to your gut and say, nope, this isn't working for me and I got to find something better. That's Uh, very brave. They were, I did a lot of a lot of things. The stroke did for me, but um, still to the, today, you know, when I go out uh, windsurfing, I do a, a terrible port jibe. Um, uh, Fifty years later, I walk with a very noticeable limp. Mm-hmm. But you know, those are the things that you think would think would be bad for what happened to me. But the good thing was, is I was at uh, Grace Hospital in Detroit, Michigan, one of the biggest hospitals in the, the area. Mm-hmm. And uh, everybody wanted to kiss, wanted to come to see me because, as you say, a stroke isn't that common. It happens to about a, a thousand teenagers a year in the United States. So you know they all wanted to come and check me out, and they come in and do their physicals and their tests on me and 
you know, we get to done, done with the interview, and I'd say to him, uh, what's wrong with me? What are you going to do for me, and when am I going to go home? And all they do is they just shake their heads. And I said, heck, I can do that. <laughs> <laughs> so I, so I, I went back. I went back to college, and very quickly, after a, a, a little touch with veterinary medicine, I uh, my course was set to medical school, and then mm-hmm. went to medical school, and I met my wife, who has been my partner for 44 years, Aww. when I uh, was in Grand Rapids, Michigan, and then we moved to Hawaii just to have some fun, and mm-hmm. we had a great, great time for a year. I was in a surgical uh, in, internship. And we didn't want to leave, and so I looked for a job, and the job available was as a sugar plantation doctor, mm-hmm. which is a doctor that works uh, taking care of people who are workers on a sugar sugar plantation. You do everything for them. Mm-hmm. I had 5,000 people to take care of, Wow! and uh, I caught 100 babies. I did brain surgery in the middle of the night. I did you know, pretty much everything that had to be done because I was it. I was the doctor. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> it was an experience nobody gets today. I mean, maybe you go to Africa, you have a yeah. that kind of experience. But we were just in Hawaii uh, about four days ago. We took uh, one of our uh, McDougal adventure trips. We take people <clears throat> uh, to different parts of the world so they can have a great vacation, eat well, and be with nice people. And we just, just got back uh, from seven days from Kauai. So it brings up a lot of memories for me, those days we lived uh, on, in Hawaii, which was 15 years one of the things that they don't don't have anymore is they don't have sugar plantations, and they don't have sugar sugar plantation doctors. Mm-hmm. I learned I learned a couple of real important lessons there, because I was pretty much the only doctor there. There were three other doctors that who had similar training. Uh, I had to do everything, and uh, I was very very disappointed in my uh, outcomes. My patients did did not do well. Mm-hmm. I, I would I do pretty good, you know, things like lacerations, sewing them up, and um, straightening broken bones, and lancing abscesses, and giving them antibiotics. But when it came to chronic dis- disease, which is what most of the people listening to this show had mm-hmm. have now, my plant, plant plantation patients they had these, you know, chronic obesity, chronic stomach pains, chronic high blood pressure, chronic diabetes, chronic cancer, cr- multiple sclerosis, arthritis, you know, on and on and on. Uh, 80% of my practice was chronic disease, and I did nothing, nothing, nothing good for these people. I'd give them, you know, bags full of pills. It was mm-hmm. a, it was free medicine. It was a they had, we had our um, own infirmary in our own hospital, so they were completely covered. Mm-hmm. So it didn't cost them anything, and you know, I kn- knew after a short time that what I was doing didn't work, and it was so frustrating after three years. Wow. To be to want to be a doctor that did things. I don't know if you remember Marcus Welby. Ben Casey and Dr. Kildare. But those are the doctors I wanted to be like, those TV doctors, and my patients weren't getting better. Mm -hmm. So it became a very frustrating experience for me, and that was one of the reasons I left after three years to become a board-certified internist because I wanted to learn the tricks. I wanted to learn how to help my patients. Mm -hmm. I hadn't learned. I don't know why, I just hadn't learned. The other thing that happened to me during this uh, three years of my life we lived on the sugar plantation. I took care of uh, first, first, second, third, and fourth generation Filipinos, Chinese, Japanese, and Koreans. My first generation, born in their native land, uh, learned a diet of rice and vegetables and almost no meat and no dairy. Mm-hmm. And they moved to the, uh, the Big Island to start new families and, and a whole new life. And they married, married over here and usually married over here. They brought a bride. And they'd have children, and the children, uh, they were a little bit more westernized. And mm-hmm. so they got a little fatter and a little sicker mm-hmm. as they ate less rice and more American food. And by the time you got to the third generation, I was taking care of people as fat, if not fatter, than, I, than the ones I'd learned uh, from Detroit. So it was, it was very obvious to me that food had something to do with disease. Yeah. And uh, the worse you ate, the better you were, the thinner you were. You know, if you skip the first two food groups, the dairy and the meat group, and just lived on starches, vegetables, and fruits, you were the healthiest and strongest and best looking of all the people. Yeah. So it really made me question everything. And when I went back to uh, Oahu, where I attended the uh, uh, John Burns uh, School of Medicine uh, to become an internist, I had access to the medical library. 
And my eyes had been opened, and I went to the library, and I just spent, you know, all my free time, which was a lot when you're working as a training doctor. I spent all my free time reading the the science, and there were tens of thousands of papers that that said what I saw, and that is when people live on starch-based diets. And just to clarify that for your listeners, what I mean is starch is. Uh, high calorie veg- vegetable food, high in carbohydrate or sugar calories. Mm-hmm. It's like rice, corn, potatoes, beans, peas, lentils, sweet potatoes, potatoes, uh, beans, peas. Like I said, uh, th- th- those are your starchy foods. Mm-hmm. And uh, <clears throat> I'd found that, you know, tens of thousands of papers were written and put in the library shelves that said the same thing, that people who ate these those kinds of diets avoided the common diseases that we had in the U.S. Oh, really? That, uh, Back then, everyone yep. was saying that. Oh, oh this isn't. This isn't. Ni- this is in 1970, uh, 1976. Amazing. And they were saying it. Uh, they were saying it uh, the, uh, for a previous one hundred years, but these uh, articles never got any attention. They were basically worthless mm-hmm. because they promoted no business, no money. Of course. So, and I mean, it's just a fact. It's not a conspiracy. And they were, you know, dust collecting on the shelves. Well, I had this passion, this interest, and what I found out was that the same things that prevent disease also allow the body to cure disease. When you stop throwing gasoline on a fire, things get a lot better. And so I saw back, uh, you know, back in the 20s, uh, even, even earlier than that, there were doctors who know the things, who knew what I know now. And... Uh, 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 they were taking patients with the rich diseases, and they were putting them on simple diets. Mm-hmm. Dr. Russell Henry Chittenden was one of the earliest. He, he worked in about 1907. He was um, the head of Yale's uh, uh, physiology department. Mm-hmm. And uh, he, he would take, take people just like I take care of now, and he would change their diet, and they would perform better as athletes. And they would lose weight, and their arthritis pain went away. I mean, all the things that happens now. In my practice, he did that. And then there was a, another guy named Walter Kempner who came from Germany just before World War II in 1939 to Duke University, and he started something to something called the Rice Diet. Mm-hmm. And you know, some of your listeners have heard of the Rice Diet. It's the diet of rice, and fruit, and fruit juice, and sugar. And uh, he published scientific papers, uh, great papers, wonderfully done papers, in the journals up until about 1953 that showed all the things that I do today, they did back then with a little stricter diet, but the same thing happens with the diet I use. It's you know, essentially the same diet, right. except with a lot more variety. And they would uh, you know, take people with very severe high blood pressure, like 240 over 140, and bring it to normal, uh, just with this diet in 60% of the cases. They were curing type 2 diabetes with a diet that was 93% sugar. They, what? Uh, this is you know, blowing my, my mind right I now. I know. This is new information. Oh, my gosh. Okay. Okay. When I say sugar, what I'm saying is uh, they ate white rice, mm-hmm. juice, fruit, and table sugar. So- and some, some of the patients' diets, because they were so sick, you know, like with kidney disease, and rice has 5% of the calories as uh, protein. Mm-hmm. That much protein was too much for their kidneys to handle, so he had to make as much as half as half of the diet as table sugar, so he didn't overload the protein for the kidneys. In got it. People. And, I, I mean, he did, when I say cure, he got them back to life. Yeah. Uh, the same thing with uh, cor- uh, coronary artery disease. You probably heard of Dr. Ornish mm-hmm. first in coronary artery disease, and they prove it by doing PET scans and angiograms. So back then, we're talking about in the late 40s, uh, they showed reversal of coronary artery disease by changing in a part of the e- uh, EKG called the ST segment. And uh, what would happen is, is something that you see on the EKG that shows artery blockage it would uh, completely reverse in half the patients. And um, people with terrible congestive heart failure, you know, they're, you looked at their chest x-ray and their, <clears throat> their heart was as big as the, the, their whole chest cavity. And they would reduce them down to normal size with the rice diet. 
uh, in about half the cases, uh, they were curing psoriasis, mm-hmm. rheumatoid arthritis, and all this was going on. And I want you to know that the rice diet was the main support of Duke University for two decades. It was at Duke for seven decades. That's amazing. I'm yeah. from Chapel Hill, North Carolina, next to Durham, where Duke yeah. is. I grew yeah. up knowing people that have gone there, and I've never heard of this. Yeah, really? You've heard of people going to the rice diet? Yeah, it was amazing. A lot of people went there just because they were too fat. Mm-hmm. And of course, they had great results with morbid obesity. But, but the, the people Walter Kempner liked to take care of are kind of like the ones I like to take care of. And that is, uh, you, you, get, you get enjoyment in life from helping people. Mm-hmm. And so one of my mottos is the sicker you are, the happier I am. Because <laughs> <You know? laughs> the more I get to help you. So, uh, no, it's, it's been going on for a long time. Dr. Time. McDougall, can I jump in and ask a question? Because what you're saying is, is I've, always, I've always loved fruit. I grew yeah. up in a family that my mom gave us lots of fresh fruit um, and juices and, and mixed with vegetable juices. But I've always loved fruit. And most... People I meet in when we do our podcasts or in the in the healing world in general tend to say, oh, no, fruit has too much sugar. But I always I'm like, no, my body craves fruit. I feel good when I'm eating fruit. So can you talk a little bit about that and, sure. and in its relation to how the rice diet helped diabetes? Because I'm, I'm kind of sitting here going, that's what I always thought. But no one no one's ever told no one's ever backed me up. So you're okay. backing me up. <laughs> it, it's a little bit more. Uh, scientifically complete and a little bit easier to understand. If you realize that we are sugar seekers, uh, if you remember your biology lessons, the tip of the tongue tastes pleasurably sugar, Mm -hmm. just like it it tastes pleasurably salt. We are also salt seekers. Mm -hmm. Now that's for people. I have a cat, my last (laughs) pet. I have a cat who has no sugar tasting taste buds on the tip of his tongue. He has taste buds for protein. I throw a potato down in front of him. He just bats it around as a ball of yarn. That's <laughs> and it's the same thing if people would naturally go for their instincts in terms of meat. Uh, you take any reasonable person and you walk them down the meat aisle at Safeway or Publix or Times and you walk them down the meat aisle and ask them to open their eyes and their nostrils. And by the end of that trip down that meat aisle, uh, they're nauseated. It's disgusting. You know, we're naturally repelled by those uh, sights and smells. Mm-hmm. Now, my cat Einstein, if I took him to that supermarket and I gave him a chance to get over the counter, he'd be, he'd be clawing the butcher and eating that stuff like it was own, like it was his own food, his diet. Mm-hmm. See, so we are, we are physically designed as sugar seekers. Uh, in, in Kempner's diet, 93% of the diet was sugar. Uh, that, you know, people love that. They love to eat that way. And the reason you love to eat fruit is because that, that's one of the more intense sugars. Now, what I have to say about fruit is I don't think it makes a good diet to be a fruitarian. And, I, and I'll tell you, you can do it. You know, Steve Jobs did it for a while. And mm-hmm. I met a few people who have done it for a while. The reason I don't think it's a, a, the best diet and the reason I don't know of any populations of people who have been on an all-fruit diet is because fruit sugar is simple sugar. And the, uh, uh, the satisfaction is limited. Uh, you're only satisfied with sugar for just a few, uh, uh, fruit for just a few minutes. And you need something that will sustain you, mm-hmm. sometimes throughout several days. And sugar will leave you uh, wanting more sugar if it's in a su- simple sugar form. Uh, I don't think it's any particular problem for most people to eat, you know, three, three, two, three, four sugars a day. When um, fall comes around here in my nectarine tree goes into bloom i'll go out there because the nectarines they're rotten in three days i'll go out there i'll get a bushel basket full of nectarines and i'll eat them all myself Mm -hmm. but i don't think that'd be a good thing for me to do every day 365 uh, days of the year it is simple sugar uh i think we tolerate it pretty well but you could convince me that it's not so good for the teeth all that sugar i don't know i don't know that for sure Uh, but i do know it leaves you uh, unsatisfied quickly what you need is you need starch. That's the kind of sugar I talk about. When you sit down and eat a meal of rice, which, by the way, is uh, synonymous for the word food in Asia. They, you know, they, they interchange the word. Mm-hmm. Uh, in China, the, the, the greeting, you know, good morning or how are you, is have you had your rice today? <laughs> That's interesting. Yeah. So 
you know, a, a rice uh, or starch has been the diet of all large, successful populations of people throughout all of verifiable human history. If you think about it, uh, the Aztecs, Aztecs and the uh, uh, Mayans are known as the people of the corn. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and, and if you go to South, South America and the Andes, uh, potatoes are the food. Uh, you know, they have 400 different species of potatoes. And when I went there about uh, 20 years ago, everybody was thin except for the, for the people who worked in the restaurants who prepared and uh, served the food to the tourists. That's interesting. Otherwise, there are no, no, no fat people. <laughs> uh, the, the, uh, the, the subject of TV news right now is uh, the breadbasket of the world. Uh, Egypt, mm -hmm. Saran, Iran, mm -hmm. Iraq. Mm -hmm. That's known as the breadbasket of the world. You know, bread, bread is the staff of life. Uh, you know, it goes on and on and on. You find a population of civilized people up until, say, 50 years ago. You find a population of civilized people, and I'll show you people where 90% of their diet was from one starch or another. In China, for example, uh, before 1980, 90% of the food intake was rice. Before 1980, fewer than 1% of the population had type 2 diabetes. In this past 35 years, rice consumption has gone down. Consumption of animal foods and vegetable oils has doubled. And the uh, incidence of diabetes has gone from less than 1% to 12%. And half of, the, half of the people in China are pre-diabetic. And that's because of the shift in food. Now, you see it all over the world. It's not just sure, yeah. China. You see it in Vietnam. You see it in uh, I mean, Mexico. used to be a very trim population of people living on uh, corn and beans and squash. Now, Mexico City brags to be the, the most obese city in the world. You know, what happened in 35 years? What happened is people gave up starch mm -hmm. and were fooled by the meat and dairy and oil industries, yeah. that the right way to be healthy is to eat their products. Even though it, it is such an unbelievable lie, I almost can't tell it, but I have to. <laughs> you know, if, 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 if I say protein, you say... How do you get your protein? Oh, you say meat. Oh, yes, I say meat. Say meat, okay. Allison. <laughs> say meat. If, you say meat. If I say calcium, you say... Milk. All right, you got it. <laughs> but, but what you need to know, and, and I've been through the science, you know, over the last 40 years, and believe me, I am not making a mistake. I know what you're you not. Need, <laughs> what, you need, what you need to know is there has never been a case of dietary protein deficiency whenever people had enough calories to eat, unless they were starving to death, they were, then they were deficient in everything. There's no such thing as kwashi or core. That, that, that occurs with starvation. There's no isolated protein deficiency. Remember Walter Kempner took rice, which had 5% of its calories as protein, and he had to cut it in half down to 2.5% because it was too much for some of his patients. Uh, protein content of, uh, of uh, you know, some of your meats is 50% and your, your turkeys and things like that go even higher. Mm -hmm. So uh, there's no such thing as protein deficiency. It's never existed. Yet an entire industry has scared yes. and lied to the public that they must eat their food or they'll wither away. I know. And I love that you're saying this. Thank you so much for clarifying this because when I went vegetarian years ago, that's all I got. Where do you get your protein? Where do you get your protein? And this was my response, not from studying, not from going to any type of medical school, just from common knowledge. I said, Who's dying of a protein deficiency that yeah. thinks that I'm now going to die when I'm eating much healthier than everyone who's asking me that damn question? So, well, you know, thank you. The, <laughs> the students, excuse me, the doctors you see today, when you start talking about diet, that's the first thing they mention. Mm -hmm. Just make sure you get enough protein. So, you know, it's, it's, just, it's so ridiculous. Okay, let's continue this game. <laughs> we already got halfway into it. Uh, I, I, I say calcium, you say milk. But you need to know there has never been a case 
of dietary calcium deficiency ever reported on any natural diet. It does not exist. Right. The disease they play off of is osteoporosis, right. which is due to high protein intake, uh, in other words, meat and hard cheeses and eggs and poultry, because now these high protein foods, and they're made of amino acids. Mm -hmm. And these acids have to be dealt with when they go into the body. And the way they're dealt with is the bones they dissolve to release alkaline material. And that's how you get osteoporosis and kidney stones and the protein damages mm -hmm. the uh, liver and the kidneys and so on. It's, it's just, uh... anyway, okay, I want one more for you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, I say omega-3 fats. Salmon. Salmon. Fish oil. <laughs> fish. <laughs> fish. You, you need to know, no fish has ever made an omega-3 fat. Fish cannot desaturate at the carbon-3 position, nor can any other animal. Only plants can make omega-3 fats. The reason that a fish has omega-3 fat is because it eats algae and seaweed. Why does everyone think they have to take fish oil? It's making me sick to my stomach. But isn't well, there know, one omega that's not in, like if you have, because there's a brand of, of omega oils that I've seen that I've used, and they say that there's one that's not in the flaxseed, but that is in the fish oil. One know, of the I, three, I, six, I, or nine. I, I don't remember which one. I can't remember what that would be. They, you know, they sometimes say that uh, people can't make enough DHA. Uh, they print some, and that, 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 of course, is made in fish. So that's probably, it's probably DHA. But it, it doesn't make any difference. It's completely untrue. There have been populations of hundreds of millions of people who never ate a fish ever in their whole life. Right, exactly. Uh, they didn't live near an ocean or, or a stream or a lake. Yeah, so, I mean, how can, it th how can what everybody knows to be true, in fact, that's the statement that sh should set you off to knowing there's a problem here. Everybody knows it's true. When it's a hundred percent wrong, and they get away with it, and it's, they do it with a marketing technique uh, called unique positioning. Mm -hmm. What uh, a company does is they find something unique about their product, and they just pump that to the public. So, what's unique about milk? It's got lots of calcium. What's unique about meat and eggs? You know, it's got uh, it's got a lot of protein. What's unique about fish? It's got a lot of omega three fats. Whether they're important or true doesn't make a darn bit of difference. This is just how marketing works. And by the way, this is not a conspiracy. You know, the people who are doing this are people just like you and I. They just have a, a little different orientation and knowledge. They're just trying to keep the business going. Keep the door. Capitalism. It's capitalism. That's exactly what it is. I mean, right? It is, sure. sure. Well, that's, that's kind of the way it is. You know, everybody knows starches are fat. Uh, everybody knows, et cetera, the things that we talked yeah. about. See, but what everybody knows is the reason that 80% of the people in this country are overweight. You know, half the people will die of heart disease. Right. One out of three will die of cancer. You know, they're all constipated. They're all, you know, they all have purple pill, prilosac, nexium deficiency. Right. <laughs> it's just, you know, it's, it, it, it is, it, it, it was just a little bit, you know, just a little bit different than the truth. Or maybe there was a little truth there. It would make sense. But since it's the entirely uh, the opposite of what's true, it makes no sense. And, I, and it really doesn't make any sense to me, uh, except for one, one basic nature of human me beings. And that is, that is they try and get as much as they can. Sure. And that means money. Yep. So, it's you know, all it's, about the money. It always comes back to the money. Anything yeah. you're being told on the media, TV, commercials, PSAs, find out who is sponsoring it and then you'll know the truth. <laughs> yeah, you at least know why yeah. they're li they're lying. Yeah, and uh, but and they are, and you know it's sad. And, and you know if it wasn't for the fact that you were killing mothers and fathers, and brothers and sisters, and sons and daughters, you know if we were just taking in uh, and uh, giving shorter lives to flat screen TVs, that might be something. Right. But that's not what we're doing. I, you would think there was some level of moral consciousness. That would, and there are. I mean, you're standing up, and I'm right. standing up, and exactly. You know, so there are some people who can see the truth and uh, care enough to 
well, I wouldn't say risks of reputation. I never feel my reputation is at risk. I don't care what they think. <laughs> yeah. But in all my years I've been doing this, I've been doing this for, for 38 years. Uh, I've never felt threatened. I've never been criticized. I've never been confronted. That's awesome. Never. I mean, never? Never. Because I feel like I mean, we've not, been not confronted. Yeah, we've you know, been criticized. <laughs> no, 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 no not, not, not to my face. <laughs> right. We, right. We, we got something interesting going that may get, get people's attention. You know who P PCRM is? PCRM. Physici yep. P Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine. Got it. Neil, Neil Bernard's group. Well, Neil Bernard and I have worked together for 35 years. Mm -hmm. And uh, with uh, my inspiration and his ability to get things done, we filed suit in uh, Northern California District Court uh, against the egg industry. And this will be heard soon. The egg industry. The egg industry, Got yeah. It. Mm -hmm. See, the egg industry, what they did is they loaded the di dietary guidelines uh, advisor board with members of the egg industry and they spent the last 20 years uh, doing research that shows the eggs are less harmful or not harmful to people. They bought the research, they paid for it. Right. Uh, if you look at my uh, January 2016 newsletter, I wrote all about this and you can see the document there. I put the document there and Shows you how you know, like ninety-four percent of the research that's out there these days is paid for by uh, the egg industry. And in fact, the, the actual number is uh, ten out of twelve studies that were used by the advisory committee mm -hmm. was paid for the, by the egg industry. One was paid for by the sardine industry mm -hmm. to promote cholesterol in sardines, and the identification of the twelfth paper but is is not known. Well, see, I looked at this myself back in uh, 1983 in a book I published called uh, The McDougal Plan. And uh, there have been hundreds of studies on how dietary cholesterol, that means animal foods, that's where dietary cholesterol comes from, animal foods, not mm -hmm. plants. Mm -hmm. uh, when you feed uh, 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 dietary to cholesterol to either animals or to people, it raises their cholesterol and increases their risk of dying of, of uh, heart disease. Well, all this came up with the dietary goals which were published in 1977, and industry decided to fight back because big food did not want to end up with the des destiny of big tobacco mm. when the Surgeon General Luther Terry came out with the Sur Surgeon General's report on smoking and health. Right. And big tobacco lost their butts. Uh, you know, there used to be 50% of people smoked in the 1970s, fewer than 20% of people smoked now. So, you know, it basically ruined big tobacco. And I want to point out that the, back then there were doctors in the advertisements smoking. So think about that and what's happening now. When you see things on TV, they're just as fake as they were back then. It's just a different industry. Interesting. Right. So so the meat and dairy industry, they got real excited about this and they put, you know, they got $23 million a year to put into uh, countering any false, any, 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 any information that degrades the egg industry. Right. So they pay, they pay for studies. They buy professors like uh, Alice Lichtenstein from Tufts University. And she happens to, by the way, head the advisory committee. Mm. She, she works for the, for the egg board. So many conflicts of interest going on. Oh, it's just amazing. Well, anyway, we, uh, we file a lawsuit. Uh, in the lawsuit, I have every reason to believe it will be heard. Mm -hmm. uh, it'll become public knowledge that the egg industry lied and uh, forced the public to believe something that was not true that ended up killing people. And my plea as a physician is in, in, the, um, in our suit, it says that uh, the egg industry and the diet, and actually the USDA and uh, the Department of Health and Human Services, which is behind the dietary gu guidelines, my complaint was that this line in the dietary guidelines 2015 for, for, for Americans. These dietary gu guidelines saying that uh, cholesterol is a is a nutrient of non-concern, and you can eat as much fat as possible. My complaint is they have hurt me professionally and personally as a doctor 
and putting me up in a position where I can't help my patients prevent disease and for me to help them reverse disease. Because they're being lied to. Because they're being lied to. Wow. Now, I don't, you know, that's, I, I have to have a personal complaint. That, that's my complaint is they are inhibiting my ability to do my profession as a doctor mm -hmm. by telling these big fat lies. And we'll see what happens. I mean, they're going to have, you know, we got a budget of like $15. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they, they got a budget of $23 million. Uh, and so it's going to be pretty interesting. But I want to tell you, we have some pretty smart people on our side. And uh, uh, I know the research and some of these other people. And they know that we know that they're lying and why they've lied. And we know what their campaign is and we know what the harm is. So we, if we get our day in court and they don't happen to have bought the, the judge and the jury, we might do something. But they probably bought the judge and the jury. Oh, I love this so much. But yeah, then I'm scared. Like, who else have they gotten to? <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, it's in, it's in the, my January 2016 newsletter, which is free. It's on my website. So you can read about it. It's fun. You can read the, the uh, official lawsuit, too. Okay, I love this so much. So we're going to take a quick break, and we're going to come right back, and we're going to talk about all the things that you're doing now, how to get on your newsletter, what to do if someone is diagnosed with cancer, what your right foods are, and we're going to talk about the McDougal MD TV show. So we'll be right back. Hey, this is John Lee Dumas of Entrepreneur on Fire, and you're listening to the Food Heals Podcast, where you'll find the tools to become a hotter, healthier, happier you. We'll be right back with Allison Melody and Susie Hardy. Food Heals Nation, are you looking for the perfect scheduling tool for your business? Are you sick and tired of sending emails back and forth and wasting your precious time on scheduling your clients? If so, we've got the solution for you. That's right. If you own a massage business, a therapy practice, a yoga studio, and we know many of you do, or even host a podcast like us, Acuity is the only scheduling and time management tool you will ever need. Take it from us. Acuity allows you to schedule clients without sacrificing your soul. And automate your client bookings, cancellations, reminders, and even payment with one click and zero frustration. You're here to make yourself money, not make yourself crazy. Clients can see your real-time calendar availability, self-select the time that works best for them, and easily book and pay for their own appointments in advance, sparing you those stress headaches, mix-ups, and grunts of frustration. Before we had Acuity, we were spending a ton of time and energy with back and forth emails, trying to book guests, and sending them questions, and having to constantly follow up and send reminders. But Acuity changed everything. Yep, Acuity has completely automated our process and freed up our time to focus on the things we love to do, like providing our Food Heals Nation with high quality content. Yes, so now instead of a mess of emails, we send our guest a booking link. They choose a time that works for them. They fill out our information form, which includes links to their website, their bio, their photo, and all the information we need, all in one place. Then the booking syncs automatically with our calendars and poof, we're done. Such a time saver. Such a lifesaver. And Acuity does so much more. Yes, you can automatically send branded and customized confirmations, reminders, and follow-ups via email or text message, and even accept payments and tips through Stripe, PayPal, Braintree, and Authorize.net with the click of a button. Get started today. Go to acuityscheduling.com slash foodheals to get a 45-day trial. That's an amazing deal, Food Heals Nation. It's usually 14 days, but we scored an exclusive discount for you, acuityscheduling.com slash foodheals. We love it, and we know you will too. All right, Food Heals Nation, we're back with Dr. John McDougal. His mantra is only sick people go to the doctor, and the annual physical exam is a ritual to be avoided. Love that. This is a subject that's really close to my heart. Can you tell me about multiple sclerosis? And what is, because um, Food Heals Nation knows that my mother had multiple sclerosis for years and years and years up until her cancer diagnosis, which is uh, the treatment of cancer is what ultimately killed her. But up until then, she was suffering from multiple sclerosis to the point where she could no longer walk. And I, at the time, we had no awareness of diet, nutrition, alternative medicine. 
So what is a typical protocol? Like if someone is diagnosed with multiple sclerosis, what is the first thing they should do? And how do you help people um, with multiple sclerosis? Well, first, first you have to understand that MS is only a disease of Western civilization. It, uh, it once upon a time never occurred in China, Japan. Wow. Now, now of course it does. Uh, the work on it was originally done by Roy Swank, who is my friend and uh, we have legal relationships together. He's dead. Mm -hmm. but we, I have legal, legal responsibilities to him. And uh, he did work that showed that MS virtually is stopped when you take the animal foods out of the diet. And it's published in The Lancet. And mm -hmm. It's published in uh, Amer American Journal of Clinical Nutrition and all kinds of big MS journals. He was head of neurology at o Oregon Health and Science University for 23 years. He took care of over 5,000 people with MS and virtually stopped the disease in every single person. Oh I'm sorry, God. can you repeat that? He took care of over 5,000 people with MS? Yeah. And they virtually stopped practically all of them? Yeah. In their it, MS? It, what, what they were, yes. Yeah. And, that, it, and this, this is communications that I have recorded from him. But he published uh, work in The Lancet in 1991 about MS and showed that uh, the people with MS died like three times faster than those without MS. A really good researcher. He's a very good researcher, very good man. Well, anyway, he was my friend. And uh, <clears throat> I uh, learned about diet and MS when I was in, on my neurology rotation when I was a resident for internal medicine. And uh, I, I started a foundation, a 501c3 foundation, raised about three quarters of a million dollars. And I went up to HSU and I said, I'd like to do a randomized control Raider blinded study of the best quality you can possibly do on uh, MS patients and uh, putting them on my diet. Well, there's if you want to re read about the results, this is my July 2014 newsletter. Okay. We, sh we showed some amazing things uh, about uh, diet and how the diet we teach can be, be followed with great consistency. One of the most inter interesting things that we found was that uh, you know, we have a control group and an intervention group. Is the control group stated a diet for a year at 40% fat? The intervention group, those who went to my clinic, uh, dropped their fat intake to 15% and maintained that for a year. And what we what we found from our uh, uh, evaluations is that 85% of the people who went to our intervention mm -hmm. followed the diet a hundred percent for a year. We also found a twenty pound weight loss sustained for a year, and a twenty point drop in cholesterol sustained for a year. Mm -hmm. So we permanently changed people's diets. Uh, yeah, and it was a, you know it's amazing research. Uh, we have uh, presented it at two meetings and in two abstracts, but we're finding it near impossible to get, get published because the journals are owned by the MS drug companies and the food companies, and they have no interest in work like this. But we are going to get it published. I mean, we're going to second-tier journals now just to get it out. But when we, went, when we went to the big five journals, like the New England Journal of Medicine, and JAMA, and so on, uh, they, they just, just turned us down flat. And these are some of the best researchers in the world at one of the best universities in the world and one of the most important studies to the world. And uh, anyway, that's kind of the way it went. But you, you can stop the disease with a change in diet. You could also re reverse some of the problems because people lose weight and they get physically stronger. But if this is multiple scler sclerosis. These are multiple scars. Mm -hmm. Scars won't go away. But what you can do in terms of stopping the disease, as Dr. Swank told me on several occasions, I asked him what the failure rate was, and he said about 1 in 200. Oh, my God. Dr. McDougall, I just thank you for telling us this story and however we can support getting your research out there. Like we're a small podcast, but I want to spread this knowledge with the world. It okay. is so close to my heart. I have such chills and I'm feeling so many, so much emotion. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what you do. I'll tell you what you do. I was ra raised, I was able to raise through uh, my friends. Seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars. That's amazing. That's, a, that's about the amount of money it takes to study for a drug company to study whether or not it's worthwhile to do a study. Mm -hmm. 
We need seven million five hundred thousand oh dollars. You know, I mean, well, why not? Look at what they, have to, if they put it into these pills, right? And uh, you know, a, a new machine, and and often they turn out to be more harmful than most often. They turn out to do more harm than good to people. So the reason we can't get the money to do this is it cuts people's food bill by 40%. It stops their sickness. There's no financial interest. This is not a conspiracy. It is just business at, at its worst. Right. It is. And I've had a very dear friend that was diagnosed with MS um, who was very aware of diet and, and healing her body, um, taking control of, of her own healing and asked her doctor, you know, will my di- can I change my diet? Will it affect anything of, about my health, my MS? She said, no, you can go out and eat a pint of haagen It won't matter. Well, see, the, the problem with that and the, and the real uh, criminal problem with that, and I do, I do mean that, is uh, this doctor uh, was trained to learn about the human body and didn't get any education in nutrition. Right, right. And didn't take any trouble to tell the person. This would be like, <clears throat> say you believed uh, heart surgery worked, which it doesn't for chronic coronary artery disease. But everybody else believes it does, except for those who read the science. Say you believe that it, it, it would be of great advantage for somebody to have an angioplasty or to have open heart surgery. And a patient came in with chest pain uh, and talked to the doctor. And during the whole conversation, the doctor didn't mention once heart surgery. And then, then the patient died. This would be a criminal case. The doctor would be taken to court mm-hmm. and sued, if not worse. Right. Now, if you go to a doctor because you're constipated and they give you a laxative and never mention your food or you have MS and never mention all the research that's published on MS and diet, treatments that do no harm, improve the general body health, and uh, and work, they're never mentioned. I mean, how many how many millions of doctors should be put in jail? I know, I agree. That, that's a strong statement. I I know that's a strong statement. But see, when you have a job and an obligation for your customer, yeah, and you do not fulfill that in any way, that's just not past a mistake. And I think, I think, I may live long enough to see justice, maybe. Well, it's all a part of the the giant, the greater machine at work, right? I mean, the doctors are trained in medical schools where, as you said, they don't get nutrition study. Um, That's not their training. Their training is to diagnose and give a prescription or some sort of treatment that does not include food. That is absolutely correct. You know, I did a a thing, I, I usually end up doing things on, on my own, and I did this one pretty much on my own, too. In uh, January of 2011, I went to uh, our legislative body in Sacramento, California, and I uh, talked to some of the uh, senators. I got uh, one of the senators interested in a bill, and that bill is called SB 380. You can look it up mm-hmm. on the Internet, SB 380, California. And uh, I'm not supposed to say this, but I wrote the bill. You know, you're supposed to say it was written by the senator and stuff like that. Right, right. But I wrote the bill. And uh, then I had a, uh, a Senate select uh, committee meeting mm-hmm. in uh, about April. And I walked in there with this uh, Senate Bill 380. And the first thing that came there, about 16 senators there, first thing that came out of their mouth is, you know, you're really wasting our time. We want you to know doctors don't need any more laws telling them what to do. Mm. I said, look, you gave me a chance to talk to you. Let me just say a few words. Right. So I talked for 45 minutes. <laughs> Good for you. <laughs> and I, and I, I asked him things. I said, you know, um, do any of your friends or family have dietary diseases? And I, uh, three quarters of them are sitting up there close to obesity. And of course, they said, yeah, well, I said, well, how much did the doctor talk to you about the diet and how to cure it? And they all shook their heads. And I said, well, think about this. I said, uh, how many of you have pets? And they all raised their hand. I said, well, what if you went to a veterinarian 
and your dog or cat or bird had a dietary disease, and the doctor, the veterinarian said to you, said to you, uh, I didn't learn anything in medical school about what, my, what uh, animals eat. Mm-hmm. I said, don't you think that would require some kind of legislation to fix that problem? Oh, yeah, if you yeah. go to a doctor with a human disease and you ask them how to fix it with, with diet, they all do the same thing. They never taught me anything in medical school about nutrition, right. and they did, and they didn't. So, uh, you know, I left kind of thinking, well, that was a interesting two hours. And uh, what happened was uh, two months later, unanimously, every member of both houses passed the bill on to the governor. Wow. Governor, and governor Jerry Brown. Oh, my God. He signed it in September of 2011. The mistake was, and the way they finally beat me, and they haven't finally beaten me because that's on the record. It's a law in California that the 11 medical schools have to teach the students nutrition. Amazing. Okay. And they're not, and they're not doing it. And the, the 550 hospitals have to provide at least some nutritional education at their noontime lunches. Okay. The way they beat me is, is, is always behind my back. Everything would happen behind my back. Of course. And uh, what they did is they discharged the, the obligation to implement SB 380 to the California Medical Board. And we had a couple of meetings after that, but it was obvious that they were, they were told how this was going to turn out. So what they decided to do is they decided what they would do to, to fulfill this obligation, a law in the state of California, is to write a one-paragraph one paragraph uh, uh, about nutrition annually in a newsletter that they sent out on the internet. Oh, come on. And uh, that is the doctor's education that you now get after a few months of my work and a lot of work with the legislature and the signature, signature of Jerry Brown. They get one, one, one paragraph about <laughs> nutrition. It could be vitamins, minerals, whatever you want. Oh, my God. I'm getting angry right now. I'm so fired up. <laughs> I'm mad. But, I'm sad. <laughs> but but you see, I did it, and soon somebody else is going to do it. Yeah, and they're going to win. Yeah, it's progress. So uh, you know, it, you have to lose, and lose, and lose, so that someday somebody can win. Yeah. And I I I have to take that attitude because. If it, at my continuation of what I'm doing, depending upon me winning, I'd quit. Right. You know, I, I go and I go out there to lose. <laughs> it's, it's just like with this like uh, uh, suit we have against the egg board, which will be held very shortly. Sure. Uh, they'll they'll beat me some way or another, but in PCR, they'll do it one way or another. Uh, but someday somebody's going to get them. But at least you're fighting. Dr. McDougall, why do you think that the establishment, the medical establishment, is so resistant despite the research that you came across, you know, decades ago and the continued... In the 20s. And in the, and the, and the, and the continued evidence that well, continues to come out. It, why? It's obvious. Money. It, yeah, it's all, it's all money. You know, you, the, the average office visit is uh, seven minutes, and that's generous. And you can write a prescription or two or three in seven minutes. Uh, if you had to sit down and talk to people about uh, diet, it could take you an hour. Yeah. If you really put them through an educational program, it could take a long time. Now, Obama, uh, Obamacare has made some provisions so that uh, this kind of uh, care for people would be financially advantage, advantageous for, to employees and to doctors and so on. So some progress is, is being made. Mm-hmm. But uh, not, really. not uh, it, it's just... There's just too much money out there uh, to to change things as fast as you and I think they should be. It, I mean, this seems like a no-brainer. You know, why would why would anybody want to support a system, a food system, and a pharmaceutical system and a device system that's proven to do far, far more harm than it did good to mutilate women by amputating their breasts? Mm-hmm. Which does no good at all. We've known that since the 19, 1939, uh, by uh, making men impotent and incontinent with prostate surgeries. We've known that. We agreed upon it for over fifteen years. You know, the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force says PSA tests should not be done. 
You know, we've known that heart surgery doesn't save lives. We've, we've known that for 25 years. And the, the heart surgery business continues and accelerates every year. And I have three friends, people in my life, two who have had mastectomies and one who is getting one. And they think that is the only way. And it makes me sick to my stomach. Well, they don't read the newspaper, which comes out with articles. There's been a couple, that, not, not this year, but mm -hmm. in the last six months, that have clearly shown that mastectomies don't save lives. I mean, it's just in the newspaper. It, it stays in the newspaper for sometimes a couple of the days. And then they go to their doctor, and the doctor says, oh, well, that's nonsense. Right. I mean, how could you not save lives by cutting a woman's breast off? Well, let's yeah. talk about how you are saving lives with your McDougal program, because I think if I was listening right now, I would be like, well, what do I do? And you have a program that heals people and they can go to your program and do this. So I would love to hear about that. All right. Uh, we'll do it because uh, because uh, we'll do it for just a couple of minutes, because I know you guys are getting tired of all this stuff. No, we want to have, we want to, right. we want to record love all, all night. We love <laughs> all, all this right. stuff. Well, we, we, we can do it again in a, in a little while, a little bit. Sounds Especially great. when we get I, political, I, have, I get fired I, I up. I have a website. It's called drmcdougal.com. Yes. Almost everything is free on it. I mean, really everything is free on it. You can't go to Hawaii with it's free. Right. We have to charge you. You can't go to my 10 day program for free, but we have you know, over 500 recipes there. They're free. Uh, all the stuff that I've talked about in articles about uh, diabetes, prostate, etc., that's all free. So you can go there and uh, learn some things. But I think that the best thing to, to learn from is something called Dr. McDougall's Color Picture Book on Food Poisoning and How to Cure it with Beans, Corn, Rice, Potatoes. Okay. It's a, it's a color picture book. Just like a children's book, except it's written for adults, mm -hmm. and it's like sixty-six pages long. You go, you take, you know, eight minutes to go through that. You'll understand everything. It'll be absolutely clear. I think fact, I need to uh, get my husband that book and a packet of crayons. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's not. It's not a book. It's on the website, and it's oh. in. It's in twenty-four languages. Wow, that's amazing. So you, so you can, you know, have your friends in China read it. Uh, so. I'd go to the website and just spend some time fooling around there. There are probably 150 Star McDouglers there. Mm -hmm. uh, the recipes are there. The meal plans are there. The article, the art, I gave you the article on MS, July 2014. You can find the two articles I wrote about SB 380 mm -hmm. and how we tried to win and lost. And, uh, you know, there, there are articles on pretty much everything. Everything I do as a doctor uh, treating high blood pressure, treating diabetes, treating obesity, uh, you know, a, a lot of the things that I believe in terms of the, the environment. Uh, 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 yeah, it, it, you'll be amazed. People come away from that website and they write me quite quite often. Yeah. And they say, where's the gimmick? Where, where's the gimmick? I mean, everything here is free. Yeah, what are you selling here? <laughs> what you sell? So what we're selling is uh, self-gratification, I mean, for Mary and I. Yeah, uh, we we uh, had the great fortune 38 years ago, maybe it was 40, mm -hmm. to learn this kind of diet. Mary and I, I was really sick. Mary's was in pretty good shape, mm -hmm. but I was sick and dying back then. And uh, so we got saved, and uh, we felt it was our obligation to help other people. And plus, back in those days, you couldn't sell it; nobody'd buy it. Yeah, right. <laughs> and, uh, Anyway, we just got in the habit, which is something uh, many other people have learned, is that when you give, you get. And so the more you give, the more you get. And it's been that way for us. And we have people we have people who uh, come on our adventure trips. We, we make money that way. We'll have sometimes 140 people that come with us. I want to come. <laughs> well, we, have a, we have a weekend this weekend. It, we'll have, we have 350 people come, wow. coming. To uh, T. Colin Campbell will be there, or Michael Greger. Wonderful. Uh, S., uh, Dr. Esselstyn will be there. Well, a lot of very interesting, famous people. Yes. We have Ian Ornish there at times and all kinds of interesting people. So we put on these programs that do cost and, you know, keep, keep the shoes on the grandchildren. <laughs> but otherwise, uh, I promise you, everything you need 
is on that website, extremely well organized. It's drmcdougall.com. And uh, that's what I'd ask you to do. Go there and then find one, one, two, three recipes you'd like. Mm-hmm. And make them over and over again. Like Mary and I, we have uh, beans and rice maybe three times a week for dinner. Mm-hmm. Uh, you, you were going to say Dr. McDougall's Right Foods. We don't own that company anymore, but it's okay. in 6,000 6, stores. And is that kind of the staples from the diet that you prescribe to your patients, oh, or what is that? No, it, it, it's, it's, it's really good food. It's not perfect food. It's right food. Mm-hmm. Very, very tasty. Tortilla soup and pea soup and all kinds of Asian dishes. The common denominator that has that's the best quality ingredients you can do with that kind of food. Mm-hmm. Plus, there's absolutely no oil or no, no animals. Wonderful. And they're really, really popular because they taste so good. Dr. McDougall, uh, what's what's wrong with vegetable oil? Well, vegetable oil is poison. Uh, olive oil is is uh, toxic. It's. Uh, can you hear me? Hear me now? Yes, but I thought uh, olive oil was only toxic when it was heated. I thought raw oh, was okay. No, see, if you take oil out of anything, mm-hmm. like a banana, a banana, yeah, or an orange, yeah, or an olive then what you have left is oil. All the other ingredients, all the fibers, phytates, my, uh, vitamins, minerals, everything that made it into that fruit is gone. So you have an isolated concentrated nutrient that goes into the body and creates nutritional Im- imbalances. It's been shown since the 1920s that oils promote cancer even more than does animal fat. Um, the fat you eat is the fat you wear. When you eat olive oil, you wear olive oil on your skin and under your skin. Uh, there's research that shows that olive oil actually promotes artery disease, and it's good research. What about coconut oil? Well, coconut oil also. See, any of the oils are a problem because, again, you've removed all the other ingredients. Yeah. And all you have is the oil left. So a coconut's okay. It's healthy. It's healthy. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's healthy though, because, you know, when you eat the coconut meat and so on, it's healthy. But they're rich. I, I say to people the reason that uh, they put them in such hard shells is so you can't get too much of it. Mm, that's interesting. But, but nuts and seeds, they're healthy, but they're 90% fat, so they're going to make you fat. Now, if you strip the uh, oil out of the, uh, the meat of the nut or the coconut, you're not dealing with food anymore. You're dealing with a uh, drug at best. And, uh, you know, at worst, a very sickest toxin. It promotes obesity and acne and artery disease and cancer. And in my understanding, the uh, strongest promoter of cancer is oil. Wow. And uh, we're talking about vegetable oil as much, if not more so, than animal oil. But nobody just eats animal oil or vegetable oil. They eat a combination. Sure. And the combination together may be even a bigger problem. You've been, you're just being fooled by eating the oils. Right. So is your diet primarily vegetarian, no oil? What, what is the primary All right. ingredient? The, the most important un- thing you need to think about is starch. Okay. You know, if you don't get your mind opened to the fact that you are a starch eater, a starchivore, mm-hmm. a starchitarian, that you decide that what you love to eat is what you're supposed to eat, then you're not going to make it. It's the absolute key ingredient is to make starch 90% of your diet, maybe 80%. Well, going back to the rice earlier, I love rice. I could eat rice every day and I could live on it. But I worry that our modern day rice is bleached and packaged and, you know, it's not it's not real rice. How do well, we get that authentic it's food? A, it's a lot better than a pork chop. Yeah. Oh, I don't eat meat. Don't worry. You got me. Don't worry. <laughs> no. See, it, it, you, you can make things better. You can go to natural food stores. And so I can I can gorge stores. on my organic rice. I'm in. If if, if you <laughs> if you eat rice or corn, mm-hmm. uh, you can join the uh, the, the uh, most a- excellent athletes in the world if you make eighty percent of your diet starch. Like, for example, all, uh, all of the top winning places and all of the uh, marathon and triathlon races, long distance races, mm-hmm. since uh, 1968 have been dominated by the Kenyans, who 80% of their diet is corn and, 
and, and, and other starches. But what about our modern corn? I've heard a lot that it's all GMO and that it's stripped of US. nutritional value in the U.S. And then it's stripped of nutritional value. Um, any thoughts on that? Yeah, it could be better. <laughs> yes. But okay. it's a lot. It's a lot better than a you know a chicken wing. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So you, it, when you have choices, you can make you can make stricter choices if you want. You can get no GMO corn or or uh, you know you can grow it in your backyard, in good soil. I mean, you, yeah. there are all kinds of options there. It's just the, the most convenient and inexpensive way to get it is with some shortcomings. I hear you. But the shortcomings are not that serious that it'll affect people in major ways. Got it. Okay, tell us about the McDougal MD TV show. How can we watch you, that? You know what? You, you can't. I don't think you can get it anymore. It oh, was okay. on for almost 20 years. It was uh, called McDougal MD. You can try it. You can try it. Look it up. Uh, uh, Is it online? Uh, you know, it may be online. It just might be online. It was in 95% of the households for about 20 years. And uh, you can find segments of that show on my web, uh, my website when you, in the about section. Perfect. You'll see you'll see me from uh, well, probably thirty years ago to now. Well, not to now, but yeah, you, you'll you'll see my lifespan and the fact that I do age. <laughs> it's very very interesting. So there are those where you see now what we do is I put. Uh, <clears throat> Pretty much all the lectures I do, like I said, this weekend we're having 350 people to a, a lecture, and about 500 people would be watching online live. In fact, you can you can enroll. Just go to the site. You can watch this whole weekend. Uh, it's not free, but uh, you can watch it online. We have about 500 or more subscribers that watch it all over the world. That's amazing. Because the, middle of the, the weekends are amazing. You just can't believe the quality of the weekends. So uh, there's ongoing. It's more, you know, things are more the internet than anything else yeah. these days. And um, so I, I don't do the TV show anymore, but I do an awful lot of uh, of uh, internet stuff. Uh, I have uh, my own webinar every Thursday at 11 a.m. in the morning. Love it. Okay, so that's Pacific time. So Eastern time. It's right, but no. you can watch it anytime you want. Oh, you, you can watch it later. You can oh, watch the replay. Watch cool. Yeah, and you just have to sign up. There's, again, no gimmicks. You just sign up, and we send you a, a link, and you can watch it live and ask questions, ask me questions. And Love that. So we do that. I, I put out a monthly newsletter, which is always a labor of love. I've got another book coming out in, in uh, the fall. Awesome. What's your book called? It's called The Healthiest Diet on the Planet, and it's by a, a company called Harper. Well, I'm sure you heard. Yes, oh, yes. Yeah. oh, a little publishing <laughs> company, yeah. <laughs> so it's a, it's a big deal. Uh, they plan on it being a big national bestseller, just like the Starch Solution. I will buy it the day it comes out, or you can send us advanced copies and we'll review it on yeah. the show. There you go. Yeah, that'd be nice. <laughs> Absolutely, we'd be happy to. But anyway, it it should be a good book, and it will also have Doctor McDougall's colored picture book on food poisoning. Cool. To, cool. Which you really every everybody's that's listening to the show. If you just write that down and go to the website and spend eight minutes looking at the color picture book, you'll be entertained as well as your mind will be completely clear about what the truth is and your eyes will be forever opened. I mean, it's, 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 it's a result of 40 years of my work, of my thinking, and I learned how to simplify uh, things so that you don't have to believe me uh, just once you see the pictures. You go, oh, yeah, that's true. I know that. <laughs> and it's a real easy way to learn the diet. Take you eight minutes to learn the diet. Free. I love that so much. So Food Heals Nation, go to drmcdougall.com. Find the color picture book. Take eight minutes out of your life to learn his life's work and what you can do to make yourself healthier starting today. Dr. McDougall, is there anywhere else people can find you online? Facebook, YouTube, LinkedIn? Oh, yeah. We have a Facebook that has more than 100,000 followers yes i'm one of them <laughs> okay and we also uh i you know the thing is is i i have a, a really great staff that takes care of all the things that i would once have taken care of myself sure but now I you're busy get, with those grandkids <laughs> yeah I'm busy with the grandkids and uh you know I, I i get to walk up on stage and be talent love it and uh yeah it's good so a, a lot of the things just like all the internet stuff that's done was done by 
are uh, well, well, it's done mainly by my daughter. She runs the entire operation now. Great. But, but it's uh, done by a lot of fantastic people. And so you'll find the quality of, of the uh, material related to us is very high. Absolutely. It is. I can speak to that because I do follow you on multiple platforms All right. <laughs> and you are on YouTube, you are on Facebook, you are on LinkedIn and you are also, are you on Twitter? Yes. John McDougall. You know, no, I, I am on Twitter, but I don't know how to work Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's, that's the thing is Mary and I have been sitting, everybody's talking about tweeting and we've been thinking, you know, we got to learn how to use Twitter, but we're of an age where uh, it's, you just don't learn new things I like hear. you did when you were younger. <laughs> All right. Well, if you need someone to run your Twitter, my production company does that for very reasonable, and I would even give you a couple months free just to work with you. Um, oh, nice. Yeah, absolutely. It, it would probably, it, all my staff knows how to do Twitter. Oh, okay. So you're good. Well, I'm good. <laughs> it's, it's Mary and I don't know how to. We, 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 we don't know how to use Twitter. But <laughs> we're gonna learn sometime. Absolutely. All right. Do you have a last tweetable or just a quote that means a lot to you to leave for us? Well, I, you know, I hope all of us working together. Back when I started doing this, there were very few people who even knew what the word vegan was. But the world's changing. We are winning. I, I, there's no doubt we're winning. It's just we're not winning fast enough. And so I would, uh, you know, any of you who buy into what we're talking about, and think it's worthwhile. I, I just change this to a major part of your life and your and your life goal to make the world a a livable place. And uh, and I'll put every effort you can into it. Mary and I, we do fourteen hour days. Wow. Uh, anytime you have some time to do this and carry the message on, uh, I do it in whatever manner you have. Uh, some of our staff they convey the message by saying it works for me. And all my staff look mm -hmm. great. Me, I get in their face. Mm -hmm. And I don't care if I offend them or not. And Good for you. It works for me. <laughs> you know, I, whatever your talents are. A, a good speaker, a good listener, a, you know, a good demonstration, a welcoming person. Whatever you could do to get this message across is so crucial. It is really, it is the future. If we don't get this fixed, there is no future. Well, Susie and I couldn't agree more. Thank you, Dr. McDougall. Oh, it's my Thank pleasure. Thank you so Please. much. I mean, keep me, keep me in mind. We'll do it again sometime whenever you like, okay? We would love to. We love everything you're doing in the world, and we just really appreciate you know you as a force in this industry. <laughs> well, thank you very much. I enjoy it, and I enjoyed talking to you both. It was fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. All right, great. That's our show. For all the show notes, go to foodhealsnation.com slash 70. Join our private Facebook group at foodhealsgroup.com, and we will see you next time, Food Heals Nation. These statements have not been evaluated by the Food and Drug Administration. This podcast is not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease. Side effects of this podcast may include increased health and vitality, thoughts of living longer, developing a more positive outlook on life. In rare cases, people have experienced a strong desire to actually start using their 30